Hello everyone, Renee here from Schomburg Township District Library, the Programs and Outreach Department. I'm here with my colleague Annie, who will be fielding some questions from the audience. And today we're talking with Janelle Brown, best-selling author. So thank you so much for being with us. It's great. It's nice to be able to, to visit you, even though I'm on the other side of the country. <laughs> Oh, how wonderful. How wonderful. So you have a new book uh, mm -hmm. called Pretty Things, and it was just released, if I recall correctly, late April? Yeah, three weeks ago. Wonderful. So can you tell us a bit about it without giving away too much? <laughs> no spoilers. Um, it is the story of two women, uh, one of whom is a grifter and the other whom is an heiress. Uh, the grifter targets the heiress and moves into her guest house and on the shores of Lake Tahoe with her boyfriend, Lachlan. Uh, they have nefarious intentions, but things go very sideways and it all starts to get twisting and turning from there. Oh, how wonderful, how wonderful. Well, we've ordered pretty things for our book clubs and some of them will be book clubs for seniors. So we thank you. Um, previously, you had reassured us that, that it's available in large print already. So yeah. we're happy about that. And we certainly hope you'll come back for a Zoom book club for us. Yeah, absolutely, of course. I love, I love book club visits. <laughs> Wonderful. So it's also in the works for Amazon with an Amazon video with Nicole Kidman. Can you um, tell us how that's going and if there's been any kind of delays with that? Uh, well, it hasn't really, nothing's been delayed. <laughs> um, it's so Amazon, when, when the book, uh, before the book even came out, uh, Amazon partnered with Nicole Kidman's production company, um, their, her company called Blossom Films. They also did Big Little Lies. Um, and they've been trying to make projects together. And they got a copy of Pretty Things early and were really excited to turn it into a TV series. So um, we, are in, we are still in early days. We have to write the scripts and then we to, before we can go into production. But um, you know, hopefully, hopefully next year something will be coming out. Um, but yeah, it's gonna be, it's Nicole Kidman is gonna take a part and uh, it's very exciting. It must be very exciting. Definitely. So I didn't know if it was scheduled to be shooting already. So it sounds like everything is going along as planned then. Yeah. We're, we're still in what's called pre-production. There's three kind of stages of, of, of making a show. Pre-production, which is writing the scripts, um, doing all the kind of background work, casting, also on then production when you're actually going and shooting shooting the series and then post-production when you're like doing the soundtrack and the score and all that. Um, so we are very early days. We're still in pre-production mode. <laughs> so fortunately, because that means that we didn't have any canceled shoots. Well, that's good to hear. Very yeah. good to hear that. So then will it ultimately be released on a DVD for libraries to purchase and so forth? I have no idea about that part. Um, I. I have no idea. Does, does Amazon release its series on DVDs? I'm not quite sure. Uh, I know that it's streaming, so um, I do not know beyond that. I don't know how that works either, <laughs> but I do know that there are some series that the library can get and mm -hmm. they'll be available and they'll be very popular. So. Mm -hmm. so I was fascinated to see that you had written for Salon and other publications and I'd love to get your thoughts on writing books versus those shorter works that you've been involved in and you know certainly the discipline involved in writing a book. Right well I started my career as a journalist. Um, I post-college got a job at Wired magazine um, and then at salon.com in 1998 which seems like so long ago now <laughs> but um and so I spent like the first 10 years post-college working, writing full-time as a journalist. And I really wanted to write a novel. Um, and I knew that the only way I was ever gonna do it is if I quit my day job because having a day job as a journalist is, is really time consuming. And um, so I quit and I went freelance and then I freelanced for a long time uh, for publications like Vogue and the New York Times, LA Times, Elle, uh, Self, 
and um, and I was able to kind of work part time doing that, and then work on the novel full time. I mean, the rest of the time. And then since I sold my novel, my first novel, which is called All We Ever Wanted Was Everything, um, that came out in 2008. Um, and since that time, I've been really lucky that I've been able to focus almost entirely on writing novels. Um, there's two very different ways of, of writing. I mean, novels are, it's like a marathon. <laughs> it's like a marathon versus a sprint. Um, a, 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 a story that you write for a magazine or a newspaper, you, you're done with it in a couple weeks uh, or, or a couple days, a couple hours even, depending on uh, who your publication is. Um, whereas a book, it can take years and years and years. I mean, you have to be in that story for, you know, my one book took me four years to write. So. Yes, quite a different process mm. and quite a different product when you get done. So when you do write those short stories and they're off and you're done, you can breathe. So I guess you get to breathe after every chapter or what kind of discipline? <laughs> um, I wouldn't say I get to breathe with every chapter. I'd say I get to breathe with every draft. Like each time I finish a, a draft of a novel, I know I'm going to have to go back in and, and read, you know, do a second draft and a third draft, but there's always this moment of being able to breathe because you've gotten it all down on the page for the time being. And now you just have to go back and start figuring out what needs to change. But there's always this sense when I'm writing that I'm trying to, I've got story in my head and I'm trying to get it on the page as fast as I can. And until everything that's in here is on my, it's down here, I, I can't really take a break from it. You know, it's just, it's just uh, taking, it's occupying all the room in my head. Do you find yourself writing things down all the time just to capture your thoughts if you're at the store? Or um, I do, I do actually, um, you know, phrases will come to mind. I like, you know, sentences will come to mind and I want to capture them. So I use the notes function on my cell phone. Um, so like, you know, I'll, I'll like, I wake up at three o'clock in the morning sometimes and I'll have a sentence that is in my head. So I'll, I'll jot it down as a note or I'll, I'll, I'll email it to myself or text it to myself so that I have it written down. Um, that's, that's one of the ways I'm not very, my penmanship is terrible. <laughs> I'm very, very bad. I hold my, my, hold my pen in a very strange way. And so it kind of hurts to, when I write too much. So I don't do anything longhand anymore. Right, but maybe your teachers didn't think your penmanship and your work. Oh, you do have a story, though. You have a story about being in I did. By one of your teachers. First grade teacher. My first grade teacher, Mrs. House, used to come and pinch my hand because I held my pen so funny and uh, tell me that I had terrible handwriting and, and I needed to work on my penmanship. And it didn't, it didn't work. I still have terrible penmanship and I still hold my hand, my, my pen the wrong way. But I remember her coming over her and reaching over me and pinching my hand so hard to get me hold the pen right. It didn't work. <laughs> but you did have a teacher influence you to write. Yes, I did. I had a, one of my earliest teachers um, told me that I should be a novelist when I grew up because she saw how much I loved to write little stories. I, I made little books and I wrote little stories about my, my dog, Pogo. Um, in fact, I, I recently dug a big box out and found some of my early stories that I wrote in like, you know, first, second, third grade. Um, and yeah, my teacher was like, you should, you should really think about being an author when you grow up. And I was like, great, that's a wonderful idea. I'm going to do that. And then I, I never really looked back. <laughs> That is so cool. That is so cool. Those early influences. Mm -hmm. that teachers can have wonderful influences on our life. So yeah. then how do all the deadlines work when you have a deadline with a publisher? You know, is there any flexibility there at all? Um, yes and no. I mean, I think most authors uh, are a little fudge their deadlines a little bit. <laughs> I mean, if you, have a, if you have a book, they you have a contract and the contract tells you when you're supposed to turn your book in. And I always try and do it around that time. Um, but books don't necessarily arrive on schedule always. <laughs> and uh, sometimes they're a little late 
And I certainly think that right now with the situation that we're in in the world and the pandemic, I know a lot of authors are having a hard time focusing and writing. And so I have a feeling that there's going to be a lot of missed book deadlines in the spring, um, a, a spring a year from now um, or later this year. Uh, but your publishers tend to be tend to be generous about that as long as you're not really um, really making a, a mess of your deadlines. I think if you don't turn your book in at all, then you'll have to pay your advance back and that's a whole different problem, but I don't think that happens very often. Right. And then what about the title and pretty things? You know, how did the book cover come about? How do, how does the artwork and the titles all come together? Do you get to choose from some mock-ups? Um, so the, I'll start with the title. Um, the title is, both the title and the cover are things that you really work with your publisher on. Because as much as the, um, as much as you, the author, may know about storytelling, the publisher knows about publishing and marketing and what, what makes someone pick up a book and look at it, right? And to even want to get into the words. So having a great title and a great cover is really important. Um, now, I would not say that I'm very good at titles. <laughs> And I definitely don't know anything about covers, but uh, for this last book, I had a different title when I sent it to my editor and she loved the book, but you know, she and, and the rest of the people over at Random House were like, we don't think this title works. Let's come up with a different one. So we spent almost a month brainstorming titles with my, my agent, my editor, the publisher, the marketing department, we all like just brainstormed list after list after list until we finally came up with one. Um, it actually ended up being a line in the book. There's a couple there's a couple places in the book where I use the phrase pretty things. And my agent was like, oh, that's that's what you should, that's what you should do. So I was like, you're right, yes. And everyone loved it. So we were all very happy when she came up with that idea. And then as for the cover, um, the way it works is the book is done and inside Random House, my publishers, there's the art department and the art department uh, will come, takes, takes all the materials and they brainstorm covers. And so they came up with four different covers for me and, and, and sent me those covers, it's mock-ups. And I had to kind of look through them and see if there was one that I liked or one or two. And then we narrowed them down to two and went back and forth quite a bit about which one we liked better and then ended up with this one, the Pretty Things cover that you see, and which, do I have a copy here? I should show it. Oh, I don't even, I have it right here. Hang on. Sorry about that. I realized I should show you what the cover looks like. Yes, Pretty Things. <laughs> so, um, so it's got jewelry all over it. And one of the early versions that they sent me had different jewelry. Some of them had like some, um, some like big diamond baubles that looked like doorknobs. And we decided to take those off because they looked too much like a doorknob. And then the other thing that we changed is the font in, in, early, in an early version was kind of wavy. Um, and we decided to make it a much more kind of clean sans serif font. So there you go. That's how it ended. <laughs> Wonderful, wonderful. Right, because, you know, I struggle writing headlines. And, you know, back in the old days, they used to have people just writing the headlines. And that yes. was a job. So I, I really appreciate you shedding some light on how does a book title come about. Mm -hmm. And especially I enjoyed seeing your cover of your book. We have not received ours yet. It's going to be oh, a while for them yeah. to come to the library and get processed and everything. But I know that our book clubs will really in the book and then tell us a little bit about your uh, first book if you have time. Uh, well I've, I've written four books now this is my fourth. Um, my my first one was called All We Ever Wanted Was Everything and that was a satirical domestic drama about a family that kind of falls apart over the course of a summer when the husband's company uh, goes public and he becomes very rich very quickly and leaves his wife. Um, so that was kind of a funny dark um, funny dark uh, novel. And my second novel was about a married couple, similar, similar in vain to the first novel, it's funny and dark, 
about a couple whose uh, house goes into foreclosure and their marriage falls apart. <laughs> so those two had some similarities. And then my last novel was, a, was more of a suspense novel like this one is. Um, and that one was about a, a woman who goes hiking. Uh, it was called Watch Me Disappear. It's about a woman who goes hiking and, uh, and vanishes and everyone's presumed dead. A year later, her, her teenage daughter and her husband, who are still grieving her loss, uh, start to suspect that maybe she's not dead after all. So, <laughs> and that one was a New York Times bestseller. So that was, that one was a, a fun one. Wonderful, wonderful. So Annie, do you have uh, some questions uh, of your own or questions from our viewers? Yeah, if anybody is listening, I if I can direct your attention to the Q&A box at the bottom, if you have any additional questions, if you post them there, I'll be happy to read them aloud so that we can ask them. Okay, so while we're looking for some questions here, maybe we can ask you how your life has changed due to all this, and do you still have time to write, uh, or are you are you homeschooling your children, or how's that all working? Um, it has been a challenge. Um, I'm home with my husband and our two children, who are seven and ten, and so we are in the, the thick of, oh, eight and ten. My son just turned eight last week. Uh, I forgot. Um, and we're, we're in the weeds. We're in the weeds with, uh, with homeschooling. Uh, our, our kids have adapted really well, but it's still a lot of work. Um, someone needs to kind of be on them all the time. And uh, that's definitely made it a challenge to be, to be doing the writing that I need to be doing. But we're starting to work a system out where we, we kind of take turns who's down who's down with the kids and who can go lock themselves up in the, in the office. I, I clearly got the office right now. <laughs> I'm, I'm locked away. Um, and, you know, we're, we're trying to work it out. It's, it's, it's hard. I think most writers I know are, are struggling right now to, to find the space to write. And even if they don't have kids that they have to homeschool, it's, uh, it takes a lot of creativity to write a book. And when you're anxious about the, the, the state of the world, it's sometimes hard to, to muster up that creativity. Right. So Annie, uh, do you have any, do we have any audience qu uh, questions to share? Joanne would like to know, what was your favorite book to write? Oh, that's a good question. You know, each book has been uh, kind of special in its own way. <laughs> I think um, you know, I had fun writing my very first novel because it was my very first novel and I just was just having a blast doing it for the first time. I felt a uh, kind of freedom like I had never done it before and so I could do anything and it all felt new and exciting to me. But um, this last book, Pretty Things, was I think maybe my most fun to write um, because you know, I'm four books in now as an author, and and because of that, I just knew what I was doing a little bit more. Um, there's less of the 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 imposter syndrome <laughs> where you feel like you you're you're doing it all wrong and everyone knows it and they're gonna find out, <laughs> and more of the okay, I'm 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 really a published novelist now, and and because I know what I'm doing, I can start having a little bit more fun with the form and being more experimental and. Um, trying things that I might have been afraid to try in previous novels. Um, also writing about con artists and, and, and rich people living in, in, you know, grand old crumbling estates on the shores of Lake Tahoe. It was a pretty fun world to, to get into. Oh, I think I see someone just asked me a question in the chat. Uh, where do I get my ideas for my books? You know, each each book is different. Each book has been a different um, a different process. Uh, you know, this book, Pretty Things, came from from a couple of different places. Um, I, I remember reading a story about Kim Kardashian getting um, robbed in Paris. I don't know if you remember that story that some robbers had been following her on Instagram waiting for clues as to where she was staying and what jewels she had with her when she was traveling. And then they used that information from her own Instagram feed to um, break into her hotel room and, and rob her. 
And that was really, really interesting to me. The idea that like people would be invisibly watching you and using it as clues to target you. And so that was kind of an early idea for pretty things. Like what would, you know, what do you, what do people put on social media that they, that could be used against them? Um, and I really had always wanted to write a book about a con artist. Um, and I started um, imagining a young female con artist and what she would be doing these days and, and kind of the new, the new era of social media. So that all kind of came together to give, to give me an idea to jumping off point for this book. And I feel like all of my books are kind of like that. There's, it's not like I, I go to certain sources to find stories uh, that, to inspire me. It's more like I'll, I'll read something or he'll hear something or I'll imagine a character and it all starts to like gestate in my head and build into something. And then next thing you know, I've suddenly got an idea and it spills out onto the page. We do have another question in our Q&A section. Uh, what's your favorite underappreciated novel? Oh, well, I'd probably have to be my second novel. This is where we live. Um, all my other ones have, have been bestsellers, and that was the one that wasn't. But uh, that's, that story for me was the most personal to me because it's about a young married couple in Los Angeles who are creative and have all these kind of creative aspirations that start to crumble when the, the, the crash happens in 2008 and their home starts to go into foreclosure. And that was written from my own, the world that I lived in. So it's in a way, I wouldn't say it's autobiographical because it is not, um, it's very much fictional, but it, it is the one that hues closest to my own world and my own life. And so it felt like a, a kind of personal, a personal book to me. What advice do I have for a young person who has lots of ideas and wants to get published? Okay, um, to publish as a novelist. So the thing, I'm assuming that's what you're talking about. Um, you gotta pick an idea. First, you got, I think the first thing to do is complete something. And, and sometimes that's the hardest thing to do when you have a lot of ideas, is deciding which idea, what to stick to, what to focus on. Um, you, I, I suggest if you have a lot of ideas, maybe start on a couple of them and to try and see which one starts to come the most naturally and then put everything else aside and just finish it, write a draft, just sit down and write a terrible draft, write a really bad draft. It's okay. The most important thing is to finish a draft of a book because once you have a draft of a book, you've got it done. Um, that's like half the work is just getting a first draft on the page and, and the sense of completion and accomplishment, right? And then you can go back and you can revise and revise and revise. Um, I highly recommend for all new and aspiring writers that they find a writing group of some sort, whether it's a class that you take. Um, a lot of, you know, a lot of universities have extension classes that you can take for writing, even if you're not enrolled in the college. Um, there are workshop organizations. I don't know where exactly you live, but there's, I'm sure you can find um, writers workshops and find a group of, of people that you can work with in developing your novel that you can write pages and they can read them and give you feedback because feedback is so important. It really is the thing that motivates you to keep going, especially when you're just getting started. So yeah, the two most important things, finish something, commit to an idea, just get it on the page. Don't get intimidated by it having to be perfect or good in your first draft and get and get readers to, to give you feedback. Those are my three things. Excellent. I was just going to ask you about feedback. You know, if you call people up like, hey, what do you think of this idea and how your um, feedback progresses? Yes. Um, I you know now that I'm four novels in, I don't actually have a work, uh, uh, I don't have a writing group anymore. I did for my first couple novels where we met every week and we gave each other feedback on our pages and it was, it was amazing and it really, really helped me get on my feet as a writer. Um, for the last two novels, I haven't had that, but I do still have readers, like trusted readers who I will send a finished draft to and they will read it and give me notes and give me their thoughts. 
So I always reach out to them when I'm at a certain point where I feel like I'm ready for feedback. I'm ready for someone to give me a big, big picture of what's working, what's not working. I don't generally call people early in the idea process because I feel like that's so intensely personal. I need to kind of just let it, let it grow on its own. Wonderful. Annie, do we have any other questions from YouTube or any other chat questions or do you have some questions of your own? Yeah, one last question, I think. Um, what are you reading now or do you have any under the radar books that you'd like to recommend to our readers? Oh, okay. Um, I have been, I've actually been reading a lot of um, suspense novels right now, not just because I wrote one, but because it's actually the thing that I'm finding grips my attention the most at the moment. Um, I've tried reading a lot of other kinds of fiction and have found myself putting it aside because I just couldn't focus. Um, but I read a great book called Take Me Apart by Sarah Sliger, who's a new novelist. Uh, it's about uh, a woman who is, is hired to put together the archive of a dead artist and in the process of putting together her archive, um, she starts to wonder whether the woman might have been murdered. It's very, it's very fun and suspenseful. Um, I just read a book called A Beautiful Crime, which by Christopher Bolin, which is um, another book actually about uh, con artists. It takes place in Venice, and it's about a, a gay couple that has gone to Venice to, to try and, and steal money from a, a very rich man. Um, and I'm actually reading the new book by um, Robert Kolker, which is not a suspense novel, but The Hidden Valley Road, which is the new Oprah Winfrey uh, Oprah Club book, um, which is about a family. It's a true story of a family had 12 children and six of them ended up um, being diagnosed with schizophrenia. So it's fascinating, like, look at this poor family and what they struggled and went through, but also about the history of schizophrenia in America and how we've learned what we, we know about it. So those have been three books that have really held my attention in the last uh, couple months. Wonderful. Any other questions from our audience or people on YouTube? No? No. no? <laughs> we, we thank you so much and we hope that you'll come back for book club. I um, would absolutely do that. So I think we're going to combine our book club so it would be one Zoom session for all of our book clubs. Uh, mm -hmm. Oh, I do think, and Donna says to thank you uh, to you, Janelle Brown. And so, yeah, so that would be wonderful uh, to Zoom with you for book club. And we want to wish you the best. Thank you so much. And thank you for having me. Good luck. Good luck to everyone. Good luck in getting your, your library doors open again soon. I know that we're all struggling without our libraries right now. I know I certainly am. So, um, I, I hope you guys are able to get your doors open again. And thank you for doing great things like this for your community, even when the doors are shut. So this is great to see.